If I could get everyone to make sure. Hi, it's Brenda. <laughs> so this should be, hang on. I'll just make sure everybody can see this. I just want to make sure that everybody's light is off. On red. Otherwise I have problems with your, uh, your mute and your unmute, please. It should be red. It yes. should not be red. Oh, okay. It should... No? Okay. Let's turn it off. off. Turn it off, please. If, it's mine? Because oh. otherwise you're locking it. Okay. And I can't unmute you. Oh. Yeah, turn We're... it off. Turn it off. <laughs> it should not be red. red. Okay. No red. No red no, on no the red microphone? No Including red me. on the microphone, please. Okay. Mine's... There Thank you, you go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Counselor. <laughs> oh, I'm just trying to cooperate and do whatever you want. <laughs> It's off, Steve. Andrea, it's Mike. How do yes? I turn that off? Just press, Just press it. My headset's a little different. Um, doesn't seem. Uh, oh, really? It isn't uh, the Jabra? It is, but it doesn't have those commands around the uh, center button as yours does. So it doesn't have a touch point on that center button. Really? Is there another? Yeah. You guys got, got the one that was on sale. <laughs> it was part of the, the ones we bought, though. Is that the uh, two He's very frugal. He's very frugal. <laughs> That's our finance department. Yeah. <laughs> it only has one headpiece, too. Are we done with the sound check? How come? Am I off now? No. Okay. No, you're there. Am I here?
good to go. Thank you. Okay, folks, I'm going to call the uh, the meeting to order. Thanks uh, all for tuning in. Uh, for those that are tuning into the live stream, and thank members of council for your diligence in getting here and getting set up. Um, um, good morning to everyone. And uh, the city of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territory of the Erie, Neutral, Hirawan, Dot, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. The land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and a set back to a share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase 1792 between the Crown and the Mississauga, the credit First Nation. And today the city of Hamilton is home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, North America, and we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can better understand our role as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. Uh, members of the public are advised that our meetings are webcast live by the City of Hamilton and temporarily archived on the city's website. And a reminder as well that electronic devices are to be switched to non-audible functioning during this council meeting. I'm sure it uh, may or may not apply at this point, but notwithstanding, let me go for a roll call here. Then I'll start with uh, Councilor Wilson, if you indicate, if you're, I'm good. Thank you, Councilor Wilson. Present? Present. Thank you, Councilor Farr. Here. Councillor Nan? Here. Councillor Maru? Present. Thank you. Councillor Collins? Present. Councillor Pauls? Glad to be connected. Good. <laughs> Happy we are. Councillor Jackson, I reversed that order. Yeah, you did well. You sound distant, Councillor. I'm not sure why. Maybe your Here. microphone not as close to your mouth as it should be. Councillor Danko? Here. Councillor Partridge? Present. Councillor Whitehead? Councillor Vanderbeek. I see you. Okay, Councillor Ferguson. Present. Councillor Johnson. Present. Councillor Pearson. Councillor Pearson, can I quite hear you? Okay, I see you. Yeah, got it. Right, Present. Thank you. And Councillor Clark. Present. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to turn to Madam uh -oh. Clerk to ask if there are any changes to the agenda, please. Madam Clerk. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. There are three added communication items. Uh, 4.1, correspondence respecting concerns with the Urban Hamilton official plan. We have recommendation to be received and referred to the General Manager of Planning and Economic Development for Appropriate Action. Item 4.6, correspondence from the Honorable Sylvia Jones, Solicitor General, with a recommendation to be received. 4.7, correspondence from Vivian Underdown, Food Advisory Committee Chair, and Ellie Bowen, Food Advisory Chair, with recommendation be received and referred to consideration for item 6.3. We have six written delegations. We have three that are delegation from the West End Home Builders Association with a recommendation be received and referred to consideration of, of item 5.4B. We have three written, re written delegations respecting report FCS 20023, New Development Water Customer Attachment Billing Policy, with a recommendation be received and referred to the consideration of item 5.4A. There is a revised appendix to discussion item 5.4B, the proposed amendment to the tariff of fees for planning and engineering development applications. There is one discussion item being withdrawn. This is item 5.4E, Metrolix Transit Initiative Program, report number PW20027. There is one added notice of, notice of motion from Councillor Farr, 7.1, Downtown Mosque call to prayer twice daily during Ramadan. That is all. Okay, thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, could I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Moved by Pearson, seconded by And we will go to vote, thank you unless there's any comments. Everyone voted? Yep, thank you, that's carried, thank you very much. Uh, are there any declarations of interest? This is the time to so declare. Not seeing any, thank you. <clears throat> um, a motion to approve the minutes of April the 15th, 2020. 
I have a motion from Councillor Johnson, second by Councillor Partridge. Thank you. That's across the screen wave. Thank you very much. I got it. Uh, vote on that. All in favor? Or any comments? Hearing not. Thank you. Are we uh, using the electronic speakers list today? We're all aware of how to use that. Thank you. And then I'll turn, I'll turn to Council Marula. Motion on the communications items, please. Put it on the floor. Council Marula. I'll second by. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Farr, that the April 29th, 2020 Council communications be approved as presented. Um, and I'm not sure if there were any changes, but if so, as amended. Right. Thank you. So we're going to go through uh, any comments on the communications items. So we have 4 1 through 2. Four seven. Any comments on any of those? Please uh, indicate, and we will uh, go to that item. Not seeing any indication. No. Okay. So moved by Councilor Merle and seconded. All in favor of the communications, please. For vote. Oh, sorry, Councilor Clark. Apologies. Go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you. Just so, just on four point three, um, I noticed that Sergio Mancha is attached to that and he has a business interest with my son so i should be declaring a conflict okay fair enough yep and the the paperwork for that wife i'm sure will be i'll find it and get it it'll, to get, you. it'll get to you. <laughs> exactly all right thank you so thank back you. to the that, vote that was back the only one vote. thank you thank you very much back to the vote on communications then all in favor or opposed vote time Yeah, Councillor Clark, you're going to abstain on this one. Voted yes. I I voted yes, but I'm a, I declared the conflict on four three. On the one item. That's right. Yeah. Correct. We can separate that out, can we not? Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I a mover and second for. Uh, so these are all the communications items. So I don't think we need to do. One, item five one is the next item on our agenda. Uh, I'm going to turn to. Uh, Dan McKenna. Wait, Dan, just to, to preamble the report on Shadow Creek, and then we'll get into uh, uh, an overview. I think the consultants are here to uh, address any questions on the report itself. So, Dan uh, McKenna, do you want to lead off? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good morning. Uh, we do have uh, a few folks here assembled to answer any questions that may arise from uh, the report. Uh, Andrew Grice is joining me with uh, Gord Wichert from SLR and Manny Siraj from Hamilton Water are here with me down at Wentworth Street. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to answer any questions that may come as a result of the report that is before you. Just by way of a quick introduction, um, the report that is before you is responding to items three and four of the provincial order that the city of Hamilton received in November of last year. Uh, this has a very kind of narrow focus to it. And as a reminder, we were before council in early February for items one and two in the dire uh, director's order, the provincial order. Items one and two related to studies that we had been directed to undertake in relation to Shadow Creek. Item three and four, which is the focus of today's report, is in relation to studies that were undertaken in relation to Coots Paradise. So just to make the distinction between the, uh, the two pieces of work, um, the, the balance of the items in the order were, uh, I would say, uh, less important and more just uh, administrative. So. Um, We've had lots of questions, uh, both from uh, members of the community and council since the report uh, went uh, public. And so just, just as a reminder, this is a very focused report and it really is just uh, us sharing the information with council that will be provided to the ministry on May uh, the 1st as a result of the direction in the order. So lots of questions about watershed management and governance and that kind of thing, which are, I think, excellent questions and, a, and, a, and a, an important conversation to have, but for today's report, uh, this we are really focused on um, just responding to the order. So there wasn't any, uh, I would say, uh, stakeholder engagement or anything of that nature uh, because of the very focused purpose of today's report. Uh, so having said that, I, I'm going to hand it over to uh, to Andrew Grice now to just maybe give a little bit of uh, an overview on, on the, the technical portion of the report. Okay, thank you. Andrew. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Uh, and typically we would like to kind of walk you through a presentation for this type of uh, a report given the modified structure that's 
So your voice, uh, your voice, unfortunately, is breaking up. Are you uh, using a? Yeah, I'll try that. All right, I'll see. You. Is that any better? Yeah, that's everybody? better. Okay. Much better. Yep. My apology. So, like I just, I just mentioned, we would like to walk you through a presentation, but certainly the modified structure has kind of prevented a few challenge for us. So I'll just kind of walk you through at a high level for the content of the report. I'm really following up on what Dan had mentioned. Uh, this report is in front of you so that we can share the results of our environmental impact evaluation before it gets submitted to the ministry on May 1st, which is this Friday. And the director's order was received in late November of 2019. And those tight timelines to submit the report by May the 1st uh, did present some challenges for us and no additional data and samples were collected within Coop Paradise. Uh, so this report is strictly focused on existing data that we had from our partners, such as the Conservation Authority, the Royal Botanical Gardens, as well as other groups within the city of Hamilton. Uh, the evaluation did look at water quality, sediment quality, aquatic vegetation, as well as the fish community. And our consultant is here with us today to answer any technical questions you may have. I will point out that the consultant and I are going to share a computer, so there may be a delay um, as I move away from the computer and he moves over uh, to answer your questions. And I guess finally, I'd like to just remind everyone that along with the submission of the environmental impact evaluation, the city will be submitting a letter to the ministry with recommendations for remediation. Uh, that will show that no remediation is warranted based on the uh, Chateau Creek spill event. However, as council is aware in the background, we are working on an overall governance structure for watershed management. Um, and we are in the middle of recruiting our new water quality technologist, uh, thanks to council's approval of that resource as part of the 2020 rate budget. And that will really be a big step for us uh, moving forward. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Andrew. And, and, and do be mindful of that microphone. It's uh, you, you do break up every once in a while, so not sure if there's an adjustment you can make, but please do. And I'm going to go to uh, now questions on the report itself. And uh, you know, we get then Dan and Andrew and the consultant are there. So, Councillor Nan, your first step, Councillor Nan. Uh, we're not quite hearing you, Councillor. I'm not sure why. Can't hear you. Uh, your microphone is off. I can see it off here. So. Good morning. There you go. There we go. Okay. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. So I have to admit, I didn't get through the 100 page document uh, and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to ask the questions rather than try and put on a scientific brain and, and try to understand things that I don't. Um, but that said, I just wanted to get clarity around there is a consistent message in both the staff report and in, in the appendix um, referring to the limitation of data. And if I could please get uh, some comments from either you, Andrew, or the consultant about when we speak about, or when there's references to the limitation of data, how are we able to provide a conclusive recommendation if the data sets that we are working with were limited in terms of prior to the spill, in the spill, and post spill? And from my understanding of research analysis, you don't want to, um, only, you need to be able to use the consistency of pre spill, during spill, post spill in order to do a fulsome analysis and therefore put forward the recommendation. So that's question one. And okay, question... Let's, let's, deal, let's deal with that one. So let's, okay. go, let's go on that question. So the, to the consultant, I think most appropriately, and, and a name would be helpful. Gord, I think. Sure, it's, it's Gord is with us. Uh, Gord is with okay. us here today. Um, I will maybe kick that off uh, just for a moment right. and I can pass it over to Gord. I think he's having trouble hearing on the uh, open session as well. So he's trying to follow along in the background mm -hmm. here. Um, in terms of your question, Councillor, in terms of data sets, uh, yes, there is mention to limited availability of data um, within our report. Um, again, we were not able to collect additional samples within Coops Paradise due to the timing of this uh, order and the requirement to have it submitted on May 1st. Uh, so we are relying on historical information. And really when the limited data is speaking to is a, a number of points, we do have a very good representation of water quality uh, pre-spill, during spill and after spill. Uh, but within Coots Paradise particular, there are a few locations where there are not a large number of samples over that extended period of time. So in some areas, it is difficult to make um, sound conclusions when you may maybe only have a single or two or three data points um, over a 10 year period. But there are certainly a number of data points within Coots Paradise that were, were a representative number of samples for our consultant to make uh, uh, concrete conclusions. And does that refer... 
can, can we have the consultant kind of respond as well then and then and then we'll go back to you for a follow up yeah. is that possible <laughs> Bear with us, uh, Mr. Mayor. We're just uh, yep. dealing with I the logistics of this. Good. Good morning. So a note to Gord as well that uh, you need to hold that microphone closer to your mouth, I think. And uh, did you hear the question? Hello, can you hear me? Hi. Yes. Hi, I only heard part of the question. I was listening on one that had about a two minute delay. Right. Okay. So I understand so, that what I did hear was that there was a question about limited data set. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the uh, conclusivity of the the recommendation based on the limitation of data. So the, <clears throat> pardon me, the I mean, whenever we're looking at natural systems, there's always some variability, and there's always, um, and so it comes down to confidence and and. Uh, as was mentioned, there there were limitations in the data. However, um, based on on the data available, the, com the conclusions are quite firm. Um, they showed we were comparing before, during, and after, and we were focusing on water quality because that was the most complete data set. And we look when we look at the uh, compare the the after the CSO discharge data with the previous time previous to the data, it shows very little difference, uh, both in Shadow Creek as well as in Peace Paradise where data were available. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, um, the question I have is, I can appreciate that for the water quality, that that seems to be the data set that we had the most access to in terms of um, information throughout the, the study area. But as it relates to aquatic vegetation, vegetation and sediment quality and fish community, um, those are the three areas that I feel um, if we, I guess I need clarity whether or not we were able to assess data pre, during and post for all of those three categories in terms of aquatic vegetation, the sediment quality, because I have some assumptions about sediment quality and I, and I need to have them verified and then fish community as well. Yeah, so let's start with sediment quality. And in terms of sediment quality, uh, the, the most complete data were in Shadok Creek itself. And so there we were able to do at least before and after comparisons. Uh, as far as Pete's Paradise was concerned, uh, very little sediment quality data. There was some from before the spill discharge period, uh, but uh, not so much during or after. And so um, the only place really where we could do a before after comparison was in right in the, at the vicinity of the mouth of Shadok Creek where it discharges. In terms of the vegetation <laughs> data set, uh, there, that was a fairly long term a uh, record of data that extended from approximately 1996 to the present. Uh, sampled at about 20 to 25 locations around Pete's Paradise. The trouble with that data set is although it was long running, uh, data were not collected at the same sites every single year. And so there were gaps in the data. We were able to, to piece together some information based on that data though. And we were, we divided, uh, the vegetation into three functional groups. So you picture um, emergent data, I mean plants, so that would be cattails, bulrushes, those sorts of things, uh, floating vegetation, and submergent. And when we looked at those categories, we could piece together a decent story, but still I, I would have to admit that there were some gaps in the data. But when we look at, when we compare the vegetation of those types from sites that are relatively far from uh, Lower Shadow Creek and close to it, we see very similar patterns at all the sites, which to us indicates that the vegetation are responding to marsh-wide or perhaps even broader regional effects. 
and not really responding directly to uh, the discharge into Shadow Creek. Fish, um, similar long-term data, 1996 to 2019, uh, both from the Fishway as well as uh, Coots Paradise. And when we look at the, the fish data, uh, it's, there weren't as many gaps as in vegetation. There, admittedly, there were some gaps though. But when we summarize those data for the fish, they also show patterns that seem to indicate that the fish community is responding to those broad regional effects rather than to specific um, impacts associated with the, the spill into Shadow Creek. If I can clarify just on the last point, you said responding to the fish community is responding to the broad uh, kind of state of environment in the water. Um, can you can you speak to that a little bit more in terms of um, how do, how does the fish community respond? Is it having right. a biological impact? Is it having a patterned impact? Is it having a species lifespan impact? Is it having a fertility impact? Um, just curious. Yeah, so we were looking at the relative abundance. So it would be more like a species. Quantity? Uh, yeah, number and presence. So relative abundance of, of particular species. And we, group, we grouped those by, well, we did two types of groupings, one by sensitivity to water quality and another by basically their feeding and position in the food web um, categorization. And so when we look at when we look at um, the responses to water quality, which is probably the most simpler, the simplest to understand, uh, there were changes in the sensitivity to of species overall to poor water quality, but but those changes did not seem to to be associated with the spill period. In fact, there. And this goes for all the species groups that we looked at. There were both increases and decreases within the spill period of the abundance of those species. And that's from sites that were close to the lower Shadow Creek, as well as uh, further away in, in Coots Paradise. We did that kind of, similar to the vegetation, we did that sort of spatial comparison. Thank you, Elsa Right, just writing my notes. Um, okay. So, there was, um, I, I just want to test the assumption that, um, are, is there any way in, in the studies that your, your firm consult or conducted that we have a sense of definitive understanding of how the contents of the spill and uh, moved through the water course? So there's been comments about, you know, uh, it is likely that the contents of this bill for the duration of this bill made their way through the creek, through Coots uh, and out into the lake. Is there anything in the content of your research and analysis that substantiates that that is what happened versus uh, an understanding of how much of the quantity of the spill settled down into the sediment? Yeah, that that's difficult. Had there it's one of those situations, if we could go back in time, had there been some form of tracers been involved, that would be, we could be very confident, very clear, but we can't recreate that situation. We can't recreate those data. Um, so we're relying on basically what we find uh, limited in the sediment because of the spatial collections and the time of collections, but more, uh, what we know or what we've read from other reports in terms of the general patterns of movement of water um, through Shadow Creek and then into Coots Paradise and out to Hamilton Harbor. And from the, the regional studies on that we've been able to interpret um, that are available, seem to show that essentially the water from Shadow Creek takes a fairly short path um, to the mouth or to the connection between Coots Paradise and Hamilton Harbor. Um, so then is it, for my own understanding, so you weren't able to state conclusively because we don't have the mechanisms, i.e. tracers, 
that otherwise would be able to give us the data points to be able to monitor how the water is flowing and then also monitor what else, how, how things flow uh, through that water course. Is that correct? Yeah, in the particular, but from general, from other more general studies, we have a general understanding of the, of the overall pattern. Versus the overall pattern, okay. And um, is it is it the um, is it the I don't I don't know how to say the word uh, I guess based on your research and analysis um, is this report saying that the state of the water in the body is has not been impacted any further by the spill due to the potentiality of existing uh, impacts, i.e. the spill didn't necessarily, what is the word, so I'll just ask the question, is the report saying that the state of the water was such that the spill did not further impact the quality of the water? Or is that the conclusion of the report? Yeah, that, and I think the wording of the report is that there's no long-term impact on the yes or this. Okay, that uh, that concludes my questions for right now. I do have some comments uh, prior to getting to the point of receiving the report, and uh, um, as a few questions for for staff as a result of the um, report that the face front facing report, not the appendix. So, Mr. Mayor, do you want me to hold those comments and yeah, let's, open let's up the floor with... for other people to ask questions with the consultant or would you? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. All right. Uh, I'm so going to turn to Councillor Wilson and I'll get, I'll get back to you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Councillor Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you to Councillor Nan. Those were excellent questions and many of mine uh, trying to ascertain um, the methodology and the limitations that came uh, with um, the data. Uh, particularly, um, I think what I heard um, the consultant uh, remark, I, I was trying to get my head around the, um, the environmental medium that was being used in the consideration of the, um, the COPC identifications and it was limited to surface water. And my, qu my question to staff was, um, why are we limiting it to surface water? Why are we not considering uh, sediment? And I think the answer that has been provided, not to put words in his mouth, but if you can confirm, um, we're not able to conclusively um, address the impact on sediment because um, of the limitations of the, the data. So I just would like confirmation of that, please, for you. Yeah, so, so that would be correct. The, the data basic, as far as Coots is concerned, um, were, were limited both in the time of collection as well as spatially. So if we want to do that before spill, post spill comparison of sediment data, it was basically restricted to locations near the mouth of Shadow Creek where it enters. So the mouth, and of course, uh, Coots is much more than the mouth of Shadow Creek. It's a, a very varied and valuable broader ecosystem. Um, is that correct? Yes, Coots is much larger than the mouth of Shadow Creek. Right. Um, so are you able to help me understand um, a question that was posed to me by a resident? Uh, did we do, in, in your work rather, was there any work done, just so I understand, to track down where um, the 2,500 tons of sewage settled? Lord? Uh, yes. So. The, the scope of our study was existing information. So we did not undertake investigations to try and track um, the sediments and where, where it all settled. What we did rather 
was, again, like we mentioned, where existing data were available on sediment, we could do the comparison, albeit in a limited spot. And then we use um, water quality as, uh, let's say, a more immediate indicator of, of, um, of conditions. And for those, for water quality, we had a, a more comprehensive data availability. And so we could um, look at conditions both includes paradise as well as for the group um, covering the pre-discharge, pre during discharge, and post-discharge period. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Wilson. Uh, thank you. Through you, um, Mr. Mayor, on page uh, six, Gord, of the SLR report, I'll give you just a second to go to it okay. if you don't have no. Excuse me, bear with me. I just have to, I've got it loaded up, but I was on a separate computer. So. Not at all, no problem. So page six? Yes. All right, I think I'm there. Thank you. Um, there's uh, a reference made um, to Mr. Tice Theismeyer, and right. um, and I'll read it in case uh, the folks who are watching this um, don't have access to the report immediately or or at all. It says the waters of Shadow Creek are reported to quote bypass the majority of Coots Paradise as it enters the marsh near the outlet to the harbor with minimal impact to the center of the marsh. And it's attributed to him from a site which I tried to find in the references, um, Coots Paradise Water Quality Group. And if I could, if you indulge me, um, I just want to make sure I have the right references on page 51 of your report. Is that uh, the reference, Coots Paradise Water Quality Group 2012? Is that the reference? Uh, it's Paradise Water Quality Group 2012. I believe so. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm, this is a, um, a quote taken by uh, someone who works um, and has worked, my understanding, at the RBG for some time. Um, what was the role of the RBG in this report? Because there's something attributed to the RBG here, um, and I think that's the only other than data a, um, reference. So I'm just trying to understand. Work. Right. So. Uh, we had a data sharing, the city had a data sharing agreement with Royal Botanical Gardens. And through that agreement, um, we had access to the aquatic vegetation data, the fish community data that we used uh, quite extensively uh, in this project. I think it's an important point for me to understand as a governor though, you had access to um, data as part of a data sharing agreement, but I just want to make sure I understand, did the RBG have a role in this report? Did it review the report? Uh, I understand. Oh. And comment on the report? Is it satisfied with the report? Does it share I, the same conclusions okay, as with this one, report? One question at a time here. Uh, Andrew or uh, Dan, did you want to kind of address that in terms of uh, contact with the RBG? 
Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so the RBG did not review the technical or the council report before we submitted it to council. We did make them aware of it once it was uh, put online. Um, that would not, I would say that I, that's not normal protocol for when we're reacting to a ministry order. Uh, certainly a lot of the information that was used and analyzed as uh, through this process was actually produced by the RBG and you see references there to uh, to Tyson some of the uh, the reports so uh, that data sharing agreement um, we really relied on the RBG for a, a, a fairly decent amount of the data and the reporting that we analyzed in order to respond to the uh, to the order but there was no review by um, by RBG uh, subsequent to us providing this information to uh, to council thank you yes sir thank you that that is very helpful for me to get that clarification because when I saw the quote and um, the quote is used and it's a, a, from um, something that's dated 2012, which of course pre predates the spill. So I think if we were going to be attributing something um, and an assessment of what someone is making, it should be equally, I think, um, consistent for us to um, ask that person, would they, um, given the duration and the volume of the spill, whether they would still um, be of that opinion. So I just um, I think in fairness to that person and that was taken out um, and used. Um, my other question has to do with, just so I understand, uh, Dan premised, I think, the remarks, this item is a consent uh, item. And I'm trying to, and of course, consent items are there usually on an agenda so um, that they we move them along. The last time this council um, received a report pertaining to the Director's orders one and two, I believe, was February the 13th. And that report was due February the 14th. So council received it on the 13th and it was due on the 14th. Um, this report is being received on the 29th and it's due May the 1st. So what is my responsibility and what is my, res my role in now um, having this report in hand as a public steward. Um, is it my responsibility or is there any opportunity to um, influence the content, um, make a different recommendation? I'm just trying to ensure that understand what my responsibility is through you, Mr. Chairman, or Mr. Mayor. So through you, Mr. Mayor, if, if I may, uh, these, uh, I will say that these are not <laughs> ideal conditions for us to be bringing information to council. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the, 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 uh, the question. Uh, the reality is in order for us to get this work done and submit it to the province on the deadlines that they gave us, it was incredibly tight timelines. And I can tell you that we just received all the information uh, late last week in order to uh, be able to form our response to the ministry. Uh, certainly in a perfect world, we'd like to be able to bring this to council with uh, 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 in a much earlier time frame. So if there was follow up questions, I, I can tell you from my own experience, traditionally, um, we do respond to a variety of different orders uh, through a variety of different ministries on a regular basis uh, without um, often they are just a matter of uh, administration and, and they don't go to council. Obviously, because of the uh, the profile and the uh, significance of this event, uh, we wanted to make sure that everything was coming to council so that council was well aware of what we were sharing with the ministry. So uh, I would characterize this um, as, a, as a very unique situation. One, because we are bringing the information to council, but two, because of the very tight timelines that we've had to uh, to meet. Um, and, and maybe if I just maybe expand on that a little bit, the, the questions around uh, kind of the design of the sampling um, because the orders were received at the end of November, uh, there was no opportunity for us to do any dedicated sampling and, and design a sampling uh, protocol for the work that was requested for Coots Paradise. And that's why uh, we ended up relying so heavily on uh, existing data. And so 
Um, they're, they're excellent questions that are being asked, unfortunately, because of the order coming in at the end of November, our inability to do sampling um, in order uh, as a part of our analysis. Uh, that's why you end up kind of seeing the gaps and maybe, uh, um, you know, the older data that we're relying on to uh, to form this, uh, this opinion that we had to provide to the ministry. <clears throat> Thank you. And I, I, I appreciate that you're responding to tight timelines, but again, I'm, I am, I am trying to understand the responsibility of uh, the board, or in this case, council. Um, is it our responsibility just to receive? Do we have a responsibility to comment on this report, or, um, or it is something that we're responding to according to timelines that the province has set out, and it's not our responsibility? Hey, Dad, so, so normally, again, we would we would deliver this to the province uh, without bringing it to council in the most normal circumstances, correct? Through you, Mr. Mayor, th that's my experience. Uh, you know, to, to, to make a categoric kind of uh, interpretation on that, I think I may want to rely on Nicole to maybe provide uh, an opinion on that. But that's certainly been my experience over the years as often we respond to uh, provincial orders, uh, just as I would characterize it as an an administrative process, um, I think, because of the profile and the significance of this one, that's why it's becoming coming before council. Councilor Wilson. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought there was reference to uh, Nicole. Um, I I will cede the floor and let others ask, um, um, and then I have um, uh, comments at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Jackson. Then Councilors Clark and Danko. Councilor Jackson. Thanks, Mr. M Mr. Mayor, am I on? Yes, you are. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, Mr. Mayor, in light of what you did with Councillor Nan, I don't want to supersede. I have no comments, but I just have uh, five questions based on the seven-page summary report from Director Grace. So I can either wait behind Councillor Nan, questions to staff. That's all I had. I had nothing really for the consultant. We're we're on the report. So what, what I heard from Councillor Nan was that you had comments on the on the recommendation itself okay. or on the report itself. So uh, I I say okay. questions on the report. At, uh, you're up. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Quickly, so uh, Director Grice, thank you, and GM McKinnon, thank you, uh, uh, Andrew. I'm going to read you quickly uh, four paragraphs uh, from your seven-page summary report. And I just want to read them for public consumption for my constituents. And all I'm looking to you is for a comment, affirmation, explanation, whatever. Is that fair, Andrew? <laughs> we'll know when you read it. Go ahead. Um, if I may, Mr. Mayor. So yeah, carry on, uh, Councillor Jackson. And uh, once you've read that, Andrew can, uh, can react to what you've read. Okay, I'll do a one paragraph by one paragraph. Mr. Mayor, through you, page two, Andrew, um, three quarters of the way down. Generally, it was found that the CSO discharge event created short-term water quality impacts, but no long-term impacts on Coots, Coots Paradise we observed based on the information reviewed. The environmental impact evaluation concluded that no remediation activities are recommended pertaining to the CSO spill event, and that there is also no evidence of ongoing environmental impact. Accordingly, a surface water monitoring program for the area subjected to the sewage spill prescribed as in the fourth item of the, of the director's order is unwarranted. Comment, affirmation, further explanation, please, Andrew or Dan. Andrew. Uh, so three, Mr. Mayor, I, I, I think I caught all of what you were saying there, Councillor Jackson, my apologies. I was plugging in my earphones to try and, uh, try it's, and catch it's up. The, it's the second to last paragraph on page two I read out for public consumption. Uh, yeah, so certainly I would stand behind the statements in uh, in that paragraph um, through the evaluation with our consultant SLR. Uh, Long-term impacts associated uh, with the discharge event were not present. However, as you're well aware, as kind of the, the supporter of moving some of the additional FDEs forward as part of the 2020 rate budget process, um, we are moving forward with the recruitment of a water quality technologist. And that person will be working with our external stakeholders to develop a program to sample our waterways uh, downstream of our infrastructure so that we could ensure uh, the water quality uh, and data sharing amongst those parties is. is good. Thank you. Uh, yes, director, yes. thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, Director, that was my second one I was going to read on page six. You've touched on it. And if you could, it says at the bottom of uh, the last paragraph of page six, 
Uh, the City of Hamilton is in the process of retaining this water quality technologist to oversee the program, an outline of which will be provided to the MECP, the Ministry of Environment, Conservation, Parks, by this Friday, May 1st, as required by the Director's Order. How are you communicating to the public? This was one of the five positions that Council unanimously felt needed uh, to uh, do things better in the future. Uh, how are you communicating that publicly, please? Because I think my constituents need to understand the importance and the impact of that position. Through you, Mr. Yep. Mayor, please. Andrew. Uh, so through you, Mr. Mayor. So we are currently in the middle of our recruitment process. Um, the job has closed and we are waiting to start interviews. Certainly COVID situation <clears throat> has put a, a slight delay on our recruitment process. Uh, but once on board, uh, that individual will be developing the program with our stakeholders and we'll be back in front of committee uh, later this year to give an overview of kind of what we've achieved to date, kind of the higher level governance structure for data sharing and kind of give um, some general overview of what that individual would be doing with those stakeholders so that everyone is fully aware of the, uh, the intent of that position. Terrific, Andrew. Um, Mr. Mayor, uh, third, staying on page six, a little above. I'm going to again read quickly the paragraph, Andrew. Comment, please, from you. The absence of any long-term impacts in Shadow Creek and correspondingly within Coots Paradise due to the discharge events supports the conclusion that there is no evidence of ongoing environmental impact accordingly. A surface water monitoring program for the area subject to the sewage spill is not warranted. Staff intend to submit a letter identifying this decision to the ministry director with the SLR, that's our consultant's report uh, appended by the May 1st deadline. Uh, Andrew, just further affirmation and or comment in terms of the conclusion, there was no evidence of ongoing environmental impact, please. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Three, Mr. Mayor, the, that is correct. And although it might just be nomenclature here, we're trying to really point out in our submission to the ministry that we are looking at our water quality monitoring program, but it is not as a result of the spill into Shadow Creek. Um, this is at a higher level looking at not just Shadow Creek, but all of the watersheds that are downstream of our infrastructure. So. Yes, no impact associated with the long-term impact associated with the Chidoke spill, but with council support, we're working on a program uh, more wholesome. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, fourth question, Mr. Mayor, quickly on page four, Andrew, relevant consultation. Hamilton Water staff have been working closely with public health services, legal and risk management and corporate communications. In addition, external legal counsel, who's a specialist in environmental law, has significant experience with environmental investigation charges, has been retained to assist city staff as this matter progresses, meaning currently and future. Roslyn Cooper was previously external. Is that still the same person or a different person, Mr. Mayor? Through you, please. Uh, yep. So through you, Mr. Mayor, I can start off and certainly Nicole can jump in if she wants. So yes, Roslyn Cooper is still with us on this file. Um, the content of this particular report that's in front of you today is focused on strictly our response to the ministry order for the May 1st deadline um, in terms of a status update on the investigation and other things that are ongoing. Uh, Roslyn is certainly heavily involved with that and will be available for kind of future meetings to touch on those subjects. Thank, Thank you. you, Andrew. Mr. Mayor, last question. So after this Friday, May 1st, General Manager McKinnon, what is the expectation, please, uh, moving forward? Timelines, what's the expectation? How the ministry may or may not handle this and timelines. And that's my last question, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Dan. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, ge generally the uh, the protocol from the ministry is that they, they kind of have a two-year window that they uh, have in order to exercise whatever... Uh, further actions they may take. Uh, we will, as you know, we'll be responding to the ministry with this information on the 1st of May. Uh, there's kind of two paths. The ministry will then take that information in, uh, I would say through the local branch and they'll determine whether or not they're satisfied with our recommendations or if there's any further study they may want us to do or, or they may decide that they do want us to undertake some kind of remediation, notwithstanding the recommendations that we've made. I'll say the other swim lane that occurs at the same time is the uh, the, the investigation. And uh, I think as we've uh, alluded to before, there's very little information that's available during an investigation. Uh, my sense is that uh, when they get to the 11th hour, those two groups will probably talk to one another, but um, it could be very quiet um, over the next couple of months as far as uh, either one of those swim lanes. Uh, but I do expect that with the local branch, there'll probably be the continuing dialogue. They're the folks that we meet with on a, on a regular basis. So I imagine that dialogue will continue, uh, but we we kind of see early late July, early August as kind of that uh, that point in time when uh, we'll probably hear something. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, General Manager. Thank you, Councillor Clark. You're up, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, um, 
in recognition that this is a provincial order and our staff are simply responding to the provincial order and providing the information to the Ministry of Environment as requested in that provincial order. Can I ask the question, and we've kind of danced around it, but um, have we consulted the partners to Coots Paradise and Shadoke Creek? Um, I know we've listed, I think it was on on page six of the report, we mentioned a number of partners that we actually referred to their documentation, but have we consulted with them as we move through this process? So uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll take that one. And then if Andrew wants to add to it, he can uh, certainly do that. I, I, I would say that from my experience, the amount of engagement that's happened over the last, uh, certainly prior to COVID, uh, the last six months has been a, a, an extraordinary amount of engagement with our local stakeholders, uh, meetings with the RBG, the Conservation Authority, uh, had a number of meetings personally with Chris McLaughlin from the Bay Area Restoration Council. Um, so there has been a, a tremendous amount of uh, engagement when it comes specifically to the work that is in front of you today. Uh, there was uh, engagement in the sense of we worked with those folks to get their data sets. Uh, just going back to some of Andrew's comments going forward there, uh, this water quality monitoring program that we're gonna to put together, uh, a really significant part of that will be the engagement with our, with our stakeholders. Uh, there's probably gonna be opportunities for us to leverage the work that we're already doing and not repeating work and, and, and dividing work so that we can get as much um, efficiency out of whatever we come up with as, as the program going forward. But I guess in, in, in a kind of a simple sentence, I would say there's been a, 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 an extraordinary amount of engagement uh, uh, all through last fall and right up until uh, to early March of this year. Mr. Clark. Thank you. So while they may not have participated in the drafting of the response to the order, they were consulted, you took their documentation and you've been talking about the future for Shed Oaks Creek and Coots Paradise. Is that a fair statement? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. And and, and maybe even a little broader than that, uh, the, the focus certainly has been Shadok and Coots. Uh, I think as we go forward here uh, to Andrew's comments, we're, we're looking at all watersheds uh, and, and water courses, receivers that are downstream of any of our infrastructure to make sure that uh, at the end of the day, a lot of that infrastructure is there to protect water quality. So we wanna, we wanna develop a real uh, premium uh, level program so that um, we know how that infrastructure is is behaving and performing and that we're doing everything we can to uh, to preserve the uh, and protect the water quality in those receivers downstream of our infrastructure. Thank you. So separate from this order, the city is moving forward with some type of monitoring program for all of the urban water courses and anything downstream to see what the impact is and how we can mitigate and debate. Is that a fair paraphrase? Yeah. Uh, to you, Mr. Mayor, that's <laughs> correct. Uh, you know, we obviously we got a lot of infrastructure over in the Red Hill Valley as well. So we want to we want to make sure we don't miss any of that. Uh, the other thing that we we just have to be careful is we don't want to duplicate work. The Conservation Authority as as you know, they're, they're a significant part of their mandate is all watersheds in, in the in any particular uh, area. So we don't want to duplicate work, but what we want to do is try to to enhance each other's work and to make sure that the, the data sharing is, is more uh, robust and that we're just partnering and working together uh, more so than we have in the past. Thank you. Um, a question specific to the report, if I may, on page 50, um, the second to last paragraph, that's actually a bulleted point. I think that's actually a reference to the director's order. And it says that a written surface water monitoring program for the impacted portion of Coots Paradise as identified by the work. So what I'm struggling with is how do we define the impacted portion of Coots Paradise? As one of my colleagues earlier mentioned, it is a very large ecosystem. So how did we come to the determination as to what was the impacted portion of Coots Paradise? Can't hear, you. <clears throat> Can't hear you, Andrew, unfortunately. Can't hear you still. So something's up with your microphone in your settings. Is your, is your mic on, Andrew? Uh, 
Mr. Mayor, are you still not hearing Andrew? No, no. Not still not hearing Andrew? Just, just waiting to, uh, uh, I heard something there, yep. Nope. No. Nope. right now, Andrew? Okay, is that, uh, is that better? No, we got it, yep, thank okay. you. Okay, sorry, we were trying to split our uh, line here so the, the consultant could listen along to the questions at the same time. Right. So it was a little more streamlined, but it also was a You need a splitter. Microphone. Okay, so, um, Apologies, Councillor Clark. I uh, I lost uh, I lost the line of questioning. Yeah, one more time, no, Councillor, okay. in terms of the question. Yeah, no, my no problem at all. So on page uh, fifty of the report, the second to last paragraph, it seems to be a reference to the actual order, the director's order, um, item number four, and in that it says the impacted portion of Coots Paradise. So we were directed to do a written surface assessment um, of the impacted portion of Coots Paradise. I'm trying to understand how we identified what is the impacted portion of Coots Paradise, given that it's such a broad ecosystem. Thank you. Okay. Andrew? Uh, so through you, Mr. Mayor, and I mean, again, the response that we're going to be providing to the ministry is going to indicate that there is no monitor or water quality monitoring program associated with the specific discharge. Uh, so I think we have more latitude in developing what that framework might look like. And I think we're probably going to go a little beyond what we would consider kind of the right downstream of our infrastructure, recognizing the significance of Coots Paradise and its impact on Hamilton Harbor um, and using the RBG as our stakeholder. I think we'll be defining our, uh, our sampling and monitoring area beyond the kind of the downstream influence of our, of our infrastructure. So it'll be a little bit more wholesome than, uh, than what you may think. Okay, and so um, when it says above that no action alternative is recommended, that has no reflection on the future surface water monitoring program for the the water courses. Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, that is correct. That is uh, the no uh, action, uh, no further rec action recommended is based on the remediation from the spill, but certainly we'll be moving forward with the water quality monitoring. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I, I appreciate the report, and I think it's um, excellent that we're moving beyond just a response to what happened at Shad Oaks Creek, but looking to all of the urban water courses with monitoring programs. If anything can come out of this horrible situation, that's a very positive step. So I appreciate staff's work and the consultant's work. Thank you, sure. sir. Thank you. Councillor Danko. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so recognizing that this report specifically is a response to the minister's order, um, I just wanted to go back to what the baseline was that that we're evaluating the spill against. It's not a pristine um, Coots Paradise in its original condition. We're talking the baseline is was the existing condition. How do we characterize the existing baseline water quality? Andrew? Uh, so th certainly three, Mr. Mayor, yes, uh, Coots Paradise is, is not a pristine uh, water course. It has been impacted over over the years. Um, we're looking at data sets from kind of the mid-90s, as Gord alerted, alluded to in his answer. Uh, so that was used as our baseline, but there certainly is an understanding that, uh, you know, the water quality to start with was was not a pristine, was not in pristine condition. Um, I would point out, though, that there has been significant improvements over the last number of decades. So if you were to go back 50 years, uh, the water course was in was in very rough shape. So the baseline in the mid nineties was, was better than historical, uh, but it certainly was not, uh, it was not a pristine water course to start. And, and one of those significant investments that uh, contributed to improving the water quality was the main King CSO tank itself. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Andrew. Uh, yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, absolutely. When you look at the, the expansion of our infrastructure over a number of years, so within that catchment area, um, Coots Paradise, we've got a, a CSO tank at McMaster, we've got the Main King CSO tank, and we also have the Royal Stroud CSO tank. So prior to their existence, um, and the last one of those tanks at, at McMaster went in in about 2012, um, there would have been more material discharge to Coots Paradise on a regular basis. So certainly the investments that the city has made has had a dramatic impact on reducing loading to Coots Paradise over the last few decades. So while this was a spill of untreated uh, combined sewage and, and stormwater, Previous to the CSO tanks, it just went straight in. 
uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that is correct. Prior to the existence of those CSO tanks, the discharge would have been uh, during any wet weather event uh, when our combined system was uh, reaching capacity, that would have, would have been discharged uh, to Cape Paradise on time. So I think certainly in the in the public's mind, this event has, has really focused attention on our City of Hamilton water courses. Uh, one of the statistics and in, in analysis that stood out to me in the consultant's report is that the vast majority of the total phosphorus loading in Coots is um, from Spencer Creek, which is agricultural runoff. So just going beyond Shadoak Creek, um, we already talked about the water monitoring program. So that'll be through all the various water courses, not restricted to Shadoak Creek and not restricted to just um, stormwater or sewage runoff, but also all kinds of nutrient loading, agricultural runoff, um, any other sources of um, contaminants that might be entering our water courses. Andrew? Uh, so through you, Mr. Mayor, I mean, that is kind of the ultimate goal of where we want to head. So when we look at the water quality monitoring program, it will be focused on downstream of our city infrastructure. Uh, but we've had started to have conversations about kind of what we're calling, you know, the future of RAP and what does that look like? And that certainly is um, targeted at moving from, you know, the edge of the water up into the, uh, up into the headwaters and throughout our watershed to best manage our waterways. So certainly back in 2016, John Hall, who was the director of the Hamilton Harbor Remedial Action Plan at the time, uh, working with uh, Dan McKinnon actually started the Sedimentation and Nutrient Task Force. And they brought forward a number of recommendations to committee uh, for consideration, a lot of information focused on outreach. Uh, there was discussion of stormwater rates as well as agricultural land practices. So as we move forward, um, in addition to the surface water quality monitoring, um, I think we wanna start having the conversations about the future of RAP and how we can protect our waterways and more from a holistic approach. And that would certainly capture those recommendations and, and certainly many more beyond that. And just, Going back to uh, Shadow Creek in the, the upper Shadow Creek watershed, the majority of which is, is actually in my ward in Ward 8, um, we've done a significant amount of work trying to identify cross connections um, to clean up the, uh, the upper watershed before it gets to Shadow Falls. But as of right now, it's, it's still contaminated with E. coli just as it gets to the falls before it even you know, um, makes its way down to the tank. And some of that future work, I mean, everything that we do to clean up our water courses is going to take some investment by the city of Hamilton. So you mentioned stormwater management fees, the monitoring program, um, what other kinds of, uh, of infrastructure or reinvestment of these water courses? All right, so we're, we're beyond this report now. We're talking about watershed issues, which I think in the preamble, uh, you know, we were Actually, trying to focus on this report and the the event itself, uh, the watershed issue. That's a that's a broad issue, and uh, I'd love to talk about it, uh, you know, at, at length today as well. But I think it's a little beyond this report, Councillor. So I, I, I'd ask you to just focus on the report itself. Fair enough, and I think we've already touched on like the the future of the Hamilton Harbor remedial remedial action plan. So those are, are something we can have in a future conversation. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And I, I think the whole objective uh, all the way through uh, our, our 25, 30 year history here is to improve uh, water quality everywhere. And uh, the watershed approach is going to be very, very important going forward. I've got Councillor Ferguson and then myself, and then I'll circle back to Councillor Nand and wanted to have additional comments. Councillor Ferguson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'm not going to challenge the report. It's very technical in nature. Yeah, I try to look through it, but if you look at the summary page, we have two PhDs, two ecologists, and two scientists that have authored this report. So I'm not about to challenge their skills. I don't begin to uh, be knowledgeable on this type of uh, a document. So I'm fully supportive of just simply receiving it and allowing our staff to get it off to the MOE before the deadline. One quick question to Dan though, is Dan, uh, in late January, uh, the council put through a motion about uh, your staff meeting with RBG staff about a possible solution using bioregeneration. Um, have you had an opportunity to have meetings with them about that? That was set out in their master plan. Have you had a chance to meet with them yet or has the pandemic put a hold on that? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so we did have an opportunity to meet before uh, early March. Uh, and as you can imagine, it's been put on hold. Uh, we do. We are uh, looking at the watershed uh, with, uh, in considering the, uh, the uh, project that you brought forward, um, so as we do that watershed study, that will be one of the things that we will look at as part of that study. So 
Uh, we didn't want to do it as a one-off in, in, in a single discrete location. We want to look at it from a watershed perspective to make sure that we get the, uh, I'll say the best bang for our buck, but uh, Tyson the, uh, and the folks at RBG will be uh, definitely consulted uh, as we go through that process. So you've expanded the scope beyond Shadow Creek then? It's, uh, it's essentially the Shadoke watershed that we're looking at uh, because okay. of the, the solution that you brought forward. Um, it, it's certainly an option. Uh, what we would want to do is make sure that we've explored uh, where uh, a, a solution like that may be best employed or if there's, uh, uh, we want to make sure that there's no other competing uh, uh, technologies that may, uh, may be a good solution as well. Okay, and this won't kick up again until the pandemic is over and we're back to normal. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that's correct. We just don't have the horsepower to do this right now. That's fair. Okay, that's all, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, maybe I could ask, uh, you know, so, you know, the, the, the again, the whole effort uh, all the way along has been a desire to uh, to improve water quality. Uh, when we're talking about effluent and the discharge and the spill, I mean, there seems to be some perception that this is a this is a solid mass. This is. Uh, can we break it down a little bit, uh, Andrew, in terms of uh, you know what uh, what we're talking about in terms of the discharge? Uh, so obviously there's there's uh, there's some solids in, in in the mix of that. There's storm water potentially in the mix of that, and 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 a lot of liquid. So do you have a bit of a breakdown on that. Uh, so through you, Mr. Mayor, in terms of an exact percentage, I don't, but you're certainly right. Uh, you know this tank is intended to operate during wet weather conditions. So yes, when uh, when it is overflowing, it is predominantly storm water. Certainly, there is a sanitary component because people continue to flush their toilets and do their dishes. Uh, but that is uh, very much diluted by the uh, the storm water and the rain event that is occurring. But what's the what's the average? So if you're if you're looking at our system wide, I mean, water is a significant part of 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 discharge, uh, even though there's 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 solids uh, in the mix of that. What's what's the standard in terms of what you would expect to see in any in any uh, discharge? Uh, you know, how much percentage of water? How much percentage of solids? Uh, three, Mr. Mayor. I think for an exact number, I'd have to circle back with my team, but it is predominantly stormwater. To the, uh, give me an approximate percentage. Uh, I would say during any typical wet weather event, we're looking at ninety percent plus is stormwater. Thank you. I heard I heard that, uh, and I don't know if the consultant did this calculation, but I heard I heard the the, the spill uh, characterized in tonnage. Um, is that is that a calculation that the consultant has made in terms of uh, the, uh, the the spill? Did somebody translate it from cubic meters to tonnage? Um, three, you, Mr. Mayor, I'll have to uh, I'll have to ask uh, Gord to come over, and you'll have to probably repeat the question for him. Okay, thank you. I'm here. Please. Sorry, sorry, Art. Uh, thanks for uh, shuffling back and forth there. Appreciate that. So I, I, I heard uh, a previous comment uh, expressing uh, the spill in terms of tonnage. Is that is that a calculation that you've made in terms of the spill? I mean, I, I know that there, there was a cubic meter aspect to it, but is it, was did you did you make a calculation in your report in terms of tonnage of material? No, we did not. Okay. I'm nope. just curious as to where that might have come from, and, and and back to you as well. I mean, in terms of in terms of sediment and uh, 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 a composition of effluent, when we can consider effluent, which is you know, not the most pleasant topic in the world, but the reality is that uh, you know there's uh, there's components of solids and there's components of uh, of water, uh, and and as we're talking about the uh, the the elements that may have may have got left behind in. In uh, in coots, uh, in terms of sediment and uh, and and discharge, there were a, a, no, a number of years of buildup of sediment already uh, over the last. I, I'm I'm going to go say last hundred years. I think as long as the creek has been discharging. Uh, in in terms of sediment, uh, you know, being discharged today compared to some of the data analysis you did prior to, what 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 would be the difference in terms of sediments that get left behind as a result of uh, sewer discharge into the creek and into Coots Paradise over the years? Through you, Mr. Mayor, um, that was not part of the, like we did not do estimates of the amount of sediment and so on uh, that might be left behind. Uh, we didn't really have access to that data, that sort of data. Okay. 
All right, fine, fair enough. I'm, I'm, I was just curious as to whether there was a, some sort of a calculation in terms of how that might have uh, might have flowed. I want to thank the uh, the consultant as well on the report. It's uh, a lot of expertise goes into uh, this kind of uh, kind of work, and I, I do know there's been ongoing dialogue between the RBG and uh, BAPE and BARC, and I've had those communications as well. So that's an important part of uh, how we're going to continue to move forward. So I, I appreciate the report. I do need a mover and seconder to get the report on the floor. Uh, do we have, I saw Councillor uh, Councilor Ferguson indicate earlier a seconder for that. Councillor Clark, okay, thank you. And I'm going to turn to uh, firstly Councillor Nan and then Councillor Wilson. Councillor Nan. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so, in the line of questioning and responses, there was one more question. I just wanted to clarify since the consultant is at the microphone, mm -hmm. if I may, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Gord, previously you had mentioned that we were not able to track the sediment um, from a timing perspective. Just so I'm clear, is that because of winter freezing conditions or was that uh, due to timing as uh, from an insufficient time to design and implement the testing of sediment? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, are you referring to when I mentioned about tracers and so on? Tracers and then when you had given your summary on the sediment quality. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, what what I was trying to convey there is that like if if we if someone was planning something like this or it, or knew that there was an event about to happen, that time you might you could set ground zero and so you could um, take a, a measure of sediments or you could add a tracer or that sort of thing. And then through time while the event is occurring, you can monitor periodically. Um, and in that way, uh, make estimates of movements and accumulation and, and locations of deposition and that sort of thing. The trouble is, as far as I know, this no one was aware that this was happening. And so we can't go back in time and recreate the event and take, but but again, as I was saying, if, if one was planning or if one just wanted to know general sediment transport in a water course, we could do the planning now and it could run over winter, spring, summer, fall, and so on. It's okay. just that this is a historical event. Thank you, I appreciate that uh, clarity. So in terms of my uh, comments, Mr. Mayor, it's, um, you know, it's clear that the report is fulfilling the requirements of our orders from the ministry. And at the same time, uh, we have an obligation and a duty to our community. So we've been here, I've been hearing from residents who've emailed in and called asking about, um, I guess their, their, in, their need to understand the scope of the report and get clear the level of commitment that the city is making that is being articulated. Dan, you've mentioned it, Andrew's mentioned it, several of our colleagues around the table have mentioned it. As a council, we have directed it in terms of previous council directions on this, on this issue. But um, in terms of providing a scope that's wide enough to address community concern regarding the state of our waterways. And in the report, when we reference the governance model for urban waterways, including our stakeholders to implement a water monitor, water quality monitoring program. Um, if I could just get clarity from either Dan or Guru, is there any reason that we would limit our monitoring just to water quality, or is this an opportunity moving forward, given some information? Okay, and, um, and th this is, you're talking about broader watershed issues, or are you talking about the spill specifically? Somehow we lost your audio. Is it just me or did the system just no, read? No, we kind, of, we kind of clicked out there for a second here. We, uh, we, caught, we didn't catch the last part of your comment. Uh, so I guess uh, the question was to Dan or Andrew about the uh, reference to the governance model for our water quality monitoring program and referencing the reports, uh, the current report before us indicating that there's a limitation of data, inconsistency of data, sampling, et cetera. Um, moving forward, is it possible to integrate um, aquatic vegetation sediment quality in fish community along with our water quality monitoring program? 
if okay. our commitment is here as a municipality that we are going to be responsible and work collaboratively with our other stakeholders uh, to ensure that the data that we're sharing is consistent, but also working together, uh, especially related to the impact of our city infrastructure downstream, um, would it be valuable to integrate a deeper analysis of the health and vitality of our uh, waterway and environment that makes up our waterway? And is that feasible to integrate? Into the watershed analysis that we're gonna be doing into the future. That was yeah. referenced. Which, is a, little, in the which is a little beyond the report, but go ahead, Dan. It's referenced in the report, so yeah. True. Watershed is referenced, but that doesn't mean that we're dealing with watershed issues today. <laughs> go ahead, Dan. So, so through you, Mr. Mayor, so, so I think our focus with the plan that we have before us right now from a water quality perspective or water quality monitoring perspective, the primary purpose of that will be to ensure that our infrastructure is operating properly. That will be our primary um, kind of role for that monitoring program. I do believe there will be opportunities to, to broaden the scope of that when we bring all of our partners, whether it's the Conservation Authority, the RBG, uh, or others, to, to look at other things as well. I, I would say uh, in response directly to your question, we're at the will of or the pleasure of council. Uh, when we bring that, when Andrew brings back that, um, the uh, description of that program, if there are parameters that council feels we should be uh, um, placing more emphasis on or more focus on or closer monitoring, we can certainly look at that and bring that into the program. Uh, a decision and a discussion would have to take place as to who is most appropriate to own it. It may be something that the RBG could own or the HCA could own or maybe the city. Typically, we haven't had a tremendous amount of uh, water quality uh, monitoring from a, uh, as a city responsibility. But I think as we step through this, uh, it, uh, I suspect it'll be a bit of an iterative process when we come back to council and, and we, we are at the pleasure of council, whatever, uh, whatever council would like us to see monitor, we will ensure that it gets done. Okay, thank you. Thank Elton, you, Dan. I, I appreciate that because one thing that I do want to have, you know, clearly articulated to our community and wider resident base is, is that commitment uh, by this council around, um, you know, perhaps in the past, uh, in terms of how our water systems have been designed, um, it is not unnormal for this kind of discharge to happen. It's not unnormal for uh, our water system to be designed in a way that overflows happen. In fact, it is the norm uh, across every municipality across the country. But unlike previous generations, I think what we've heard clearly articulated is that um, we don't need to necessarily be okay with that being the norm moving forward. And I'm hearing very clearly articulated by this council and our staff that there is a commitment moving forward to better understanding our waterways and making informed decisions about how we might be able to employ, collaborate and get to a place of, of health and vitality for our water system. And I think it's critical for our, for our residents to hear that level of commitment and that the path forward is going to be one that's collaborative with our stakeholders. Um, so I appreciate the leniency, uh, Mr. Mayor, in terms of being able to make some comments generally about the future um, and making comments about the piece here around the governance model and the protocol moving forward for how we're going to be working with our stakeholders. This is the most critical piece uh, for those in our community who have been concerned about this issue. They want to hear that there is a commitment to addressing it, but they also want to want detail. So I'm looking forward to talking about that broadened scope when when the report comes forward in terms mm -hmm. of uh, next steps for our monitoring systems. Thank you. Thank you. I'll have some comments on that as well in a moment. Councillor Pauls. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I have a quick question, um, either to Andrew or Dan. And the question is, since we know that this is not pristine water quality, what is the responsibility of our citizens, the way they approach the waters? Uh, it's for their safety. So what um, I would like to answer, uh, what is the responsibility? Uh, yeah. So through you, Mr. Mayor, notwithstanding the fact that we do have signage at um, the discharge points of our infrastructure to any of these water courses, I, I guess as a general statement, I would I would say that the, the community should approach urban water courses with some caution uh, because uh, development and especially development over a long period of time, be it 100, 150 years, is going to have a negative impact on the water quality in urban water courses. So they are all going to be impaired to one degree or another. And so 
uh, I would encourage them to seek out whatever information they can be it on the city's website uh, or, or certainly keep an eye out for um, our signage when it comes to infrastructure because you know, my, my belief is that all urban water courses are going to be impaired to one degree or another so they should be approached with uh, with caution thank you for yep. that uh, thank you thank you councillor wilson thank you mr mayor um uh, this, I, I understand your comments um, about trying to limit it, uh, the conversation to the report. Uh, but to be fair, this report does reference the watershed and it references it for a reason. Um, so my comments are threefold. It references for a reason um, because it's saying we can't find any discernible long-term impact on water quality from this spillage. However, it's also pointing out uh, to a quite a shocking extent, uh, those regional factors which are impacting Coots Paradise. 38% phosphorus load coming from the lower Spencer Creek. And while I appreciate Dan's focus in which he said um, his focus and the focus of staff are going to be um, on ensuring that our infrastructure is operating properly. This very report tells us that um, phosphorus loads, 20% are coming from urban runoff and 14% are coming from our CSO control. So the focus of our attention as a community starting May 1st, while this director's, director's order may be very narrow in scope, our scope as a community can't be narrow. 70% of the Shadok water uh, shed is impervious. That's a choice that we have made over time with our land use uh, dis decisions and our construction decisions. 38% from the lower Stony uh, Spencer Creek. A lot of that coming from uh, some of our agricultural practices. 10% from the Dundas uh, wastewater treatment uh, plant. I, I think, what are we going to tell our residents on May the 2nd after we file this report? How are we going to tackle those very issues, um, some of which are going to be entrenched in some very strong stakeholders, developers, farmers, commercial property owners. How are we going to move forward on really tackling those things that are impacting significantly the health and well-being of this, this ecosystem, ecosystem and then ultimately our harbor? Um, on the second item, uh, there has been a lot of extraordinary engagement going on, and I have been, I've had the privilege of being privy uh, to some of that. The challenge in all of this is we're responding to a director's order. We've been told we, uh, by staff that we had to respond quickly, very tight timelines. But we, did not consult with our stakeholders who have a hand in measuring and monitoring and responding to the health of that watershed of that of Coots Paradise. We did we did not enable them, I guess, because we weren't allowed to, I don't know, to comment on this report and its methodology and its findings. We're saying that our response has to be based on partnership but we're, we have excluded those very partners from reviewing this report. So I don't know what the RBG has to say about this report and its findings. I would appreciate their comments on um, the methodology. It's well beyond my scope and my expertise. I would appreciate their comments on the exclusion of um, uh, the sediment. To me, I think if we're talking about the ecosystem, uh, where those 
plants are growing to try and bring back the life of the marsh seems to be um, a huge piece. But that we, we can't have that discussion. We don't apparently have that data, uh, but we also don't have the feedback from RBG on this. So there's been no peer review because of the focus of this discussion and the timeline that has been sent, set out for us. So those are, um, those are the things I am struggling with. We want partners, but we've not included them in reviewing this report. We don't know their feedback. Um, we're saying conclusively with the data limitations that we have that there's no impact but then we're also acknowledging the, those data limitations. And so the sediment impact is absent. So this is um, what I'm struggling with on the 29th of April before um, an order has to be completed and submitted or um, by the, May the 1st. And that's where my reservations, it's not to, it's, <laughs> it's not to undermine anybody's um, goodwill, professional commitment, or even the work of Gord and his team. It is to our responsibility as public stewards are to try and to the best of our ability, look at what gaps now exist and where do we need to go forward? And how are we going to report to the community on May the 2nd? What are we going to offer in terms of, this is what we're going to do now. And, and that's, um, that's where I'm struggling with and having to receive this report. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see no further comments from anyone else. So, so since we wade into the kind of the broader issue, just let me just cover off this notion that uh, this is that this is a, a rather new event and uh, and that that there hasn't been an ongoing process here for decades on the work to improve water quality in our community. And I think uh, it makes me bristle just a little bit I'm that, uh, you know, some are, some are, I'm not talking to you, Council, thank you. Uh, that some are kind of indicating that, uh, you know, as, as of May the 1st, it's a whole new world. And, and suddenly we, we have to come to a conclusion that, that our watershed is impaired. Uh, we know that. Uh, this has been an ongoing process. And as uh, was pointed out earlier by the consultant and others, that uh, there was a time when all of this discharge went directly into the Coots, Paradise, Shadok Creek, every creek that we have, and the harbor, and our remediation effort over the last four years has been all about improving water quality throughout the entirety of the watershed. Are we, are we, can, do we need to take it up a notch, uh, you know, in terms of improvement? It's been a continuous improvement process. Didn't start yesterday, isn't going to start on May the 1st, it's ongoing. And uh, the improvements will need to be ongoing. And, and at, such, at some point down the road, when we're able to, in my view, prevent a lot of this material from getting into the system in the first place, will we be in a position to say that we've done everything possible to improve water qualities in our community? So I'm, I'm, I'm really kind of, uh, you know, uh, it's somewhat left with the impression that all of this started when this spill occurred. Well. I'm not even close to being true. This spill did occur. As bad as it was and as unfortunate as it is, uh, I think uh, there, there was a presumption early on that uh, this is not good, uh, but the reality is nobody would have wanted this. And the, and the other reality is that it also spilled into an area that has already over the many decades been improved, but still harmed by ongoing uh, you know, contaminant issues. We're well aware of that. That's that's the ongoing process now in terms of where do we go to next steps. Taking that watershed approach, as Councillor Clark pointed out earlier, is is fundamental. It's been part of the RAP process, quite frankly, that every organization that deals with water quality in our community has been part of, including the RBG, eight, Mark, the province of Ontario, the federal government, everybody has been in, uh, aligned to and looking towards improving water quality throughout the entire watershed. So I, 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 I don't know why you would have difficulty in receiving this report. This is just one element of a much, much broader issue uh, that, uh, that speaks to uh, how we're going to have that continuous improvement process happening in our community to improve water quality everywhere. And so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm quite delighted by the report and fact that the, the expertise has been delivered. And, you know, data sets are, 
interesting beasts. Uh, they can they can speak for you or they can speak against you. And you know, I, I, we we ought not be shooting the messenger. The reality is that data from the RBG, data from the city of Hamilton, data from before, during, and after has been utilized to come to a conclusion. Uh, you know, the conclusion might not match some of the some of the uh, thoughts that some people out in the community have. But the reality is. This is the conclusion of some of the, the, the best experts we can find on water quality issues. Is there more to be had in terms of uh, sediment quality control and uh, wildlife species and fish and wildlife habitat? Things that John Hall and many, many others have been working on for decades that have had improvement but are not pristine. Uh, yes, there's much, much, much more to do. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm quite pleased with the report in, in terms of we, we've done the, the analysis, uh, the, the timelines for the province have been tight. Uh, the reality is that they've set out what we are required to do and we're, we're filling those requirements. And uh, if there's more to be had in terms of additional requirements that the province wants to put out, I'm happy to hear from them in terms of how they're gonna partner with us to look at those additional water quality issues that are multifaceted. And so uh, how, do, how do farmers farm today how are they going to stop discharging phosphorus into our community? Are we going to stop fertilizing our lawns and stop that phosphorus from entering the water, water and wastewater system? Uh, have we already, you know, banned and, and uh, you know, gotten rid of pesticides, which has been a positive step? But there's so much that goes into this that uh, we need to be uh, mindful of in terms of uh, collective responsibility to protect the water courses in our community. And that's, uh, that's on everybody. Uh, what you put on your lawn, what you put on your driveway, the, the, the car that you drive, the gas that it discharges, the oils that it drops, all ends up on our waste and water and wastewater system. Do we have a responsibility to uh, minimize that and fix the system at the same time? Absolutely. And I think that is going to be and will be and always has been the mission. And uh, that will uh, never be altered by one spill. It, it, will be, uh, it will be the mission uh, today, tomorrow, and, uh, and 10 years from now, quite frankly. And hopefully, sometime in the future, we'll have come to a, 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 a conclusion that uh, prevents a lot of this material from getting there in the first place, which I think is the ultimate answer, and ultimately uh, have a system in place that uh, can make the appropriate remediations that uh, are required to protect our water courses, which we all want. Uh, I'm gonna turn to uh, additional speakers. Sorry for inspiring that, but I thought it was necessary on this one. Councillor Whitehead and then Councillor Maruma. Councillor Whitehead. Not hearing you, Councillor, so you're not switched on. If you've got your button. Can you uh, turn your button on, on your headset right now? No, not, not there. It'll be uh, on in the middle of your cord. Is that better? Yes, that's it. Test, Thank test. You. So um, I, I chose to be not to be an, ide uh, an ide ideologue. And the reason I chose not to be is because I don't want to live every day disappointed. The reality is, is that uh, every decision we make, we strive for perfection, doesn't mean we reach it because there's so many uh, competing issues, needs, dollars, stakeholders, uh, uh, and, and important issues to address from one, one city to another. Context is also important. I was here when uh, we made the commitment to start building these CSO tanks. We were dumping this thing straight into the harbor. Let's be clear, that's, that, doesn't, that wasn't very long ago. This is a legacy issue. I know that there was a, uh, uh, Councilor Wilson's very familiar to a former Councilor of Rubber saying Ward 1 uh, that was here for a number of years over the period of time that we we're dealing with Goose Paradise. And uh, actions then probably weren't enough. Uh, these are legacy issues we're dealing with in the context of our water courses and in the context of our experiences with uh, Coots Paradise. The question I have for Dan is, have we ever done a calculation of what is naturally occurring versus what is uh, man, man produced? Or, or mankind produced, or what humankind produced? Sorry, I gotta get it right. Humankind produced. Yeah. Through you, Mr. Mayor, if the question is about contributions uh, of uh, nutrients or contaminants into the Coots watershed. Is that is that the focus yes. of your question? Yes, correct. 
Uh, so I, I think throughout these reports, there's probably an ability to to kind of figure that out uh, in kind of in in, in, a, in a simple answer to your question. I don't think we can answer it in in, in with one sentence at this point, but uh, it is possible to figure that out. Uh, there's a number of I think areas in the uh, in the appendices that speak to the uh, loadings that are making its way into Coots Paradise, whether it's uh, from the different creek, whether it's Shadow Creek or Spencer Creek, and uh, I think it identifies whether it's phosphorus or other uh, constituents. So I, I want to highlight the fact that there is natural occurring phenomena that is in, uh, in contributing to this process. We never really uh, qualified or quantified that. Um, and I just think about the uh, significant investment that this, this city has made in those CSO tanks. And, and we need, it doesn't mean we sit on our laurels, we, we need to continue moving forward. I just get tired of uh, uh, idealists coming in and thinking that should have been fixed like yesterday when they have no context of what's happening in other cities. I would suggest that they start taking a look at other cities that have uh, uh, their major uh, um, portions of their cities along the uh, Great Lakes. You'll find that Hamilton is probably one of the best in the, in the context of controlling uh, the, the, these kinds of uh, uh, processes into the, the watershed. So I would challenge, context is important, doesn't mean that we don't continue striving to be the best, but it, it means that every city has a challenge to eliminate uh, bad things that go in the water. And Mr. Mayor, you made a pretty wide sweeping comment about um, you know the, the surface stuff. I wanna make it clear, it's what you put down your toilet too. Pharmaceuticals is another big dangerous issue that's starting to hit and in fact our waterways. We're seeing it hit, uh, impact on the, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the fish and, and, and so forth. So I wanna be clear that when you talk about watershed, it's just not storm water, it's what you put down your toilet and a lot of things that you put down the toilet, our, our uh, water system is, isn't equipped to clear out. Is that correct, Dan? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, yeah, in a general sense, I would say that's correct. We don't have the ability to uh, to filter out or treat every everything that's being put in the system. That's correct. Thank you. We, so do we, ask people, we do ask people not to put that uh, pharmaceuticals into the toilet. They need to dispose of them as as if they were hazardous material. So Cor correct. correct. But uh, that's my uh, my point is is that right. it is a very uh, a wide scoping issue when you talk about your watershed and what impacts it. So I just want to make it clear that Hamilton is probably be one of the leaders. I mean, I know that the, uh, Mr. Mayor, I don't know if you still participate in the Great Lakes uh, Mayor's Conference. Uh, we've been seen as one of the leaders in regards to dealing with affluent uh, stormwater going into the watershed. And yet we got people coming here, our, our councillors, new councillors coming in and, and painting a picture that you know we're, we've fallen way behind. And the fact is we haven't, we are leaders. And we will continue being leaders because we're having that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councilor Marula. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just quickly, um, my biggest I see concern, you waving, Councilor Wilson. I can't hear you. Sorry. My my my, my biggest concern right now, um, it has been for some time, the active use, recreational use of Shadow Creek. If you um look at it historically, it's been banned for recreational use and for years. Yet there are actual programs that are being scheduled and organized on those on those waterways against the ban for recreational use. I'm a little concerned as those that are using it should be. Many people were complaining after the spill that uh, that uh, because somehow we allowed the recreational use to continue, that it was such a earth shattering thing. The reality is they were illegally using those waterways. They're not supposed to be using those waterways. It's never been used for recreational use within as long as I've been living in, in the city, and that's since 1967. So I don't ever um, want to be in a position where we're seen as allowing this. So I'm wondering through you, Mr. Mayor, how can we actively pursue that whoever is using those waterways for recreational use discontinues doing so, and we need to make that public. As I understand, uh, proper signage is up on uh, on uh, Shiddle Creek. But Dan, uh, did you want to expand on that? Uh, yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. So the the signage is, um, you know, is located uh, at or very near are the the outfalls of some of our facilities. And as you as you understand, the creek is a much longer reach. I, I would say we're drifting a little bit into the lane of public health. I know that the public health website has information about this, and this this really is a, a, a public health. Uh, Right. Uh, I would say uh, um, scope. So um, I, 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 the only well, thing my, I would say is right. one of the challenges is that we have is we, we don't want to just litter the place in signs either. So, right. uh, so I, I, I where I'm headed though, 
where I'm ahead of though, Dan, is, is where I'd like to see is more of a proactive enforcement. But when you have institutions that are actually using those waterways for programming, I have a serious concern about that. They have some responsibility to abide by the ban. And again, some of these people were the same ones criticizing us, but they've been, they've been using those waterways illegally